number seven. Um, you're very welcome. Um, just uh, just before I hand it over to Ross for this one, just a, a couple of things just wanted to cover. Um, we're we're coming towards the towards the end of the series, so we have the uh, the, the last kind of formal presentation on uh, Monday at two o'clock, which will be been by eight. Uh, and I also wanted to flag just on the first of December at eleven. There's a BIM clinic, uh, which is kind of going to be a bit of a an ask me anything within reason. Um, so if you've got any any kind of burning questions that um, that you'd like answered, any topics that you'd like to revisit in a bit more detail at that uh, at that BIM clinic session, please send them in to to us at education at SCSI.ie because we'd like just like an opportunity to get all of those topics and questions together and um, to give the give the presenters just an opportunity to to prepare any responses that they might need to do. So uh, so do get those into us. Um, so. With uh, without further ado, I'll pass over to Ross for today's presentation. Thanks again, Ross. Sound. Uh, thanks, James. Um, everybody hear me okay, and everybody can see the screen. Hopefully, um, last week we touched on measurement uh, in general, and today we're looking at the early design stages, uh, design stage one and two, and today we're looking at design stage uh, three and four for Arc and construction, I would say. Um, I put a bit more detail in this. We had a question the last day about how does uh, the method of measurement ARM reflect uh, when producing cost plans. I put a little bit of information in, in, in here today. I hope that it uh, answers some of your questions on it. Um, I don't have the granularity on it. I'm just gonna jump through. Yeah, my name is Ross Griffin, as you guys know. Um, First couple of slides are similar to last week. Um, we're trying to bang home this message uh, that uh, measurement now, we change our process. Measurement is not done in isolation anymore. It's done through coordination and communication with our with our partners, the design team, and that the, those design teams are broken into sub-disciplines, et cetera, and each discipline has their own way of working and own process and own output. So we need to be able to communicate with them at an individual basis, or at least in in, the, in that uh, discipline level basis. And as we mentioned the last day, um, in terms of the number of models uh, unfederated, it can be anything from five to 10. So you could end up having five to 10 uh, different sub-disciplines to communicate with on a, on a weekly and fortnightly and monthly basis. So measurement cannot be carried out in isolation. We need to speak to our design teams. I think that's very important. Um, as well about the quality of information. Sometimes it might not be visible on the models and drawings, and we, we might just be in the heads of the design team and we need to be able to extract that as best we can. It is data at the end of the day um, and in, important to us as, as, as QSs. Um, likewise, the design stages, depending on uh, national standards, international standards, etc., uh, it differs from 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 country to country. If 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 you guys are working internationally, um, uh, you will come across this. Uh, we have obviously our own stages here in Ireland, kind of similar to the Reba Plan um, But uh, we're just going to look at this uh, stage three and four as identified here, which is like that a concept technical or that detailed design stage. Um, so we're, we're running into quite a, a bit of a detail in the design information and we're heading towards procurement of, of, uh, of the project and um, heading to market, bills of quantities, et cetera. More than likely we're following some type of method of measurement, whether it's a public client or private client. So, um, and Again, understanding that level of information we expect to receive at the at these stages, these three uh, stage three and stage four is important, so that we know how we're going to manage that information and and what we can take from the model and what we will need to um, extract potentially manually, but maybe derived from the modeled information. Um, I try a little bit of an explanation later on in relation to ceilings on this one. But again, understanding that level information and the question was asked last week, but what is that level of information? What would we expect? We, we need to define that in the BIM execution plan, as we mentioned. Um, it needs to be discussed with the design team. There is somewhat of a standard in terms of level of detail, but there's no standard in terms of level of information. Um, as part of the new BIM requirements next year, this will have to be defined uh, as a national standard so that 
when we do start these public projects uh, from 1st of January plus 100 million, we have a baseline standard to follow. Um, to date, we don't have that. Uh, not that I'm aware of anyway. Maybe you guys on the call are aware of something. But to date, we don't. And um, that is a huge challenge to us because obviously, what are we actually manage designing to then when it comes to level of information, level of detail? Um, and so the level of detail, what we would expect then in these uh, stages uh, is an LOD three, it could be 200, 300 to 350, uh, I would say, uh, depending on the discipline, as I mentioned before in, in our call last week, different disciplines um, deliver information at different stages. Uh, as we talked about last week, the MEP generally in those stage one, stage two, is there's very little design information available for them um, because the architecture and construction isn't locked down to a certain degree. So they're really only functional design, diagrammatic and, and specification wise. But now we're getting into these latter stages, you will see that electrical, mechanical, ventilation, et cetera, really pushing on in terms of their um, uh, level of detail, level of information within the models. Um, as last week, looking at this level of information, level of detail, um, depending on where we are, as I mentioned, it could be a 200 to 350 uh, between stage three and stage four. We would expect at stage four that everything ca everybody catches up with everybody and we're getting a, a minimum from everybody of 350. Um, based around the BIM execution plan. Uh, I did, as I mentioned the last day, taking electrical as an example, we're more than likely not going to get cables measured uh, or modeled. We might get high voltage uh, buzz bars, et cetera, modeled because of, of the size of them and, 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 and the space they take up and also the impact they have in terms of cost, et cetera. They more than likely will be modeled, but other cables will not. Uh, security, IT, et cetera, none of that stuff will be will be uh, will be modeled um, and so we need to really understand that so yes by the time you get to stage four traditional client-led design traditional procurement uh, almost all disciplines should be at that level including civils and external works landscaping etc what you'll probably see in the next couple of years is that the external works uh, drainage underground landscaping that that will kind of lag a little bit behind the development of other uh, disciplines. So what we'll often get and what we've seen in the past is that our architecture and construction and MEP within the building type itself is quite good. But when it comes to civils, we're still doing 2D. When it comes to landscaping, we're still doing 2D. Uh, we haven't got to that modeling stage yet. It's just they're, they lag a little bit behind. But let's see how we, we might be pleasantly surprised in the coming years on that. Uh, or again, if you guys have any experience on your current projects where you could say, no, Ross, we're getting our, we're getting all those external works, those civil works, um, hard and soft landscaping, all of that stuff is modeled. That's wonderful to hear. Um, so as we mentioned last week, and we keep saying this, this is in and I hope that uh, uh, you you guys uh, appreciate the, the 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 complexities between the different disciplines. We get different models, unfederated, and um, all of these models are in different structure, different structure in terms of level of information, level of detail, um, and it depends on the size of the project. As we mentioned, it depends on the des on the design team if it is a multiple design discipline if it is one organization that do both architecture full architecture full engineering that's structural and, and mechanical electrical it will depend on the, really how those contracts are structured and how that the the, the consultants are procured that will define how many models unfederated you will end up working with more than likely i would argue that if you're on a project where they are insisting on a, fed, a federated model. That's one model for the building with all disciplines included in the model. I would advise you to advise them against it um, because of the, the, the other softwares, not just Costex, Qubit, et cetera, but other softwares like 4D softwares um, and other elements, they really struggle to deal with that that level of information. We have a project there that our team were working on uh, 
quite recently and we're we're doing uh, embodied carbon lca calculation it's 850 megabytes like you, you you can't deal with that um no no platform and software can deal with it, especially if you're working off cloud based solutions uh, the lag time is just too much so um something important to to understand number of models we're dealing with and and what, and, and uh, how how we're how we're going to manage those as a discipline um often we have for example, we would our team would be structured and people would focus on the mechanical and electrical. Another group would focus on the architecture. Another one focus on the structure, and they'd they'd all work simultaneously within Caustics, uh, uh, mapping all those quantum, etc. Um, and that works quite well, I think. So yeah, architectural construction we're going to look at today. And you'll be very familiar with this uh, with this uh, image in front of us. So yes. Uh, we can only de we can only deliver this through communication and collaboration for sure with the modelers and discipline leads. So it's a really interesting time, I think, in our in our profession. We're I'm not saying that we're not already communicating and collaborating, but there is a stigma in the industry where you know there's a there's somewhat of a barrier or an elephant in the room when it comes to QSs and cost managers and architects and engineers. I would say. Um, but that's has that has to change. It's the reality of it is that we are now the users of information, and we need to be able to trust the people that are developing it um, and delivering it to us. Um, so let's get that into our mindsets. If we take nothing away from these bin bites, uh, I think Jim, you mentioned the last day. It's all about communication, communication, uh, and collaboration. Um, and I can see that uh, as as LCA and carbon also uh, becomes kind of front and center over the next number of years it's even going to be more uh, communication and collaboration uh, more open book approaches partnering uh, we can see it across the nordics at the moment the the traditional design and build or our traditional procurement is changing slightly it's getting more into partnering structure because we need visibility on information and we need to be able to transfer uh, view and and allocate risks uh, within the collaborative environment so it's it's really is changing i think but we're just going to look now at models and modeled information for architecture and, and, and engineering. What I've done is we try to take some examples from, from uh, our process within Costex and, and kind of show uh, the information we're receiving, what it kind of looks like. And then um, as a request of the last day, I've tried to include some of the measurement rules uh, from NRM2 and ARM4 and show what information we're getting and how that differs from really what the measurement rule requirement is in terms of uh, granularity. So right here, we just took a, a snippet or a section through a building. And on the left-hand side, you can see the building, com the building components or building elements or building parts, depending on the terminology, it changes. Um, but we have identified here ceilings, as you can see here as an example, and walls. And so when you look at this, you're going, okay, I get my, I get these ceiling types. We have a, a coding structure here, whatever it is. It could be uniclass, uh, if that's what we're using. This one is a Danish standard. And we have main ceiling types. And then someone will raise a question, but they'll go, but hang on a second. Our rules of measurement require us to measure you know, if it's less than 300, it's per meter. If it's greater than 300, it's per square meter. We need to identify if it's curved, it's sloping, if it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not how our design teams model. Now, what you will get is different different building types. So you, you would be able to discuss with the design team about um, uh, adding an additional code for any ceilings that are sloping, anything that is curved. But what you're not going to get out of out of uh, the engineers and architects is stuff that is less than 300 measured per meter. They're, they don't design in that way. We can never expect them to design in that way because the amount of time and effort it will take. So we're going to have to kind of derive those quantities from the models or from the drawings to, to extract them. My hope is that we get rid of that measurement in the future um, uh, from our measurement rules. But uh, likewise on the walls, underneath here when you're looking at light uh, interior light walls they could be gypsum walls for example our measurement rule again defines you need to state heights you need to state if there's if they're sloping fixes etc etc you'll get the different building uh, wall types as a type 
more than likely. So 144 millimeter thick. If you go to the specification number for this, it'll describe the thickness, the insulation, what's included in it, single board, double board, fireboard, whatever. Um, but it that's currently won't be in the model. You, you They won't define all that level of information in the model. You'll have to work closely with the specifications here. So it's not just a direct output and we're good to go, um, I, I would say. Um, so then, as, as, I, as I mentioned here, you, you get these, all these components are relating to the architectural model uh, extracted from in IFC, these components, and we're now mapping them, our model mapping, to our cost breakdown structure. And anybody working with Costex will be familiar with this. This is this shouldn't be anything anything new. Um, do we trust the 1994 square meters? I have no idea. I need to check. Um, that's what it's telling me now, but let's take a look at it and let's dig into it. Um, and so we'll we'll work with that. And uh, sorry, I just had someone pop into the door there. These are the family types coming from from the models um, defined by the the team, the architects uh, uh, within the within their process. Also, I would say nearly defined in the beam execution plan at the early stage become standard. These breakdowns, I would say, this is the type reference. So. Again, this is specific to the to the project we're working on and to the, the industry we're working in, internal light walls, uh, concrete block, uh, heavy outer walls. That's pre could be precast of and could be block wall, you know. You'll know that from your project anyway, um, uh, as the project develops uh, from the standards they're using. And that's the reference code, Uniclass, uh, more than likely uh, here in Ireland, but this one is a Danish reference. Um, and this is the information you should be receiving from the models when you when you receive it and the defi definition between external and in and internal uh, should be clear you can all you can see it in the code anyway 21 versus 22 defines it um but you can ask me then though yeah but this isn't enough information for my for my bill of quantities for your cost plans and your cost estimates it might be enough using the spec to estimate but for your bill of quantities you're going but that's not enough for us arm requires much more information we need to describe certain aspects let's get to that in a second so I, I've just tried to extract then some of the information we're working with at the moment. This is a current project. Um, it's it's a, a, a facade uh, isolated in the model just to give you an impression of of how the 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 what it looks like in terms of this office space. Um, you have a light well in the middle here. But what's interesting about this one is for me is that uh, the the architects have modeled each component of the facade different component types um within this particular design solution now that might change depending on your project depending on your approach to how you would procure and and, and measure the facade if i just break it down here and we just dig on i just isolate again another element of of the facade and we can see here the glass element three layers 54 mil glass so they have modeled it in component basis some times you might receive a model where it would be just a facade and it wouldn't be component based they would model it all under the one um layer if you like glass aluminium insulated panels whatever what have you um really depends on their approach and and this is the discussion i would say that needs to happen quite early before the design team begin to design the facade now if we look this is of course, cost planning and cost estimating and bills of quantities that we're talking about. But if we look at carbon and LCA, then we need this granularity because you'll need to be able to calculate the material volumes of glass, of aluminium, of insulation, of whatever other elements are in the facade solution in order to be able to calculate your embodied carbon on the facade. So I can see here that there's there's a need for a, an early discussion around what is the project requirements and uh, both for cost and carbon from the quantity surveyor's perspective and what is the value to to model and what is value to, to be maybe not and just include it as, as a whole. Um, so just a small example here. Again, this is Costex, but the other systems, Vico and, and, and Sterling and, and Qubit and uh cost us and uh there's a whole pile of them out there the, the principles are the same you're 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 viewing your models and you can see here just on top just to give you an example of the unfederated we've got architecture electrical ventilation uh plumbing and structural so on this particular project we have five models what we don't have on this project yet 
is externals. What we don't have on this project yet is your hard and soft landscaping. That will, that will follow in an architectural model in the next stage. So answer the question from, from last week, how many model, how many unfederated models do we get? Yeah, minimum could be five, could be 10 again. Uh, depending on 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 what you're looking at, and of course this is a single building as you can see here, uh, or I hope you can see. So I'm going to we're going to take ceilings as a bit of an example. Um, this is NRM two um, partitions and ceilings, metal frame, etc. So just I just want to kind of highlight the requirements around from NRM two in terms of measurement, as I mentioned before. You know, if it's over 300 millimeters square meter, if it's under its per meter, you have to certain elements uh, are information. Ooh, I skipped that there. Certain elements are information uh, in your level two need to be identified, whether it's insul insulation, vapor barrier, etc. Some of that stuff will come from the from the specification. Others might be modeled, as I mentioned before, whether it's sloped or curved, etc. Might be a different building component in the model. If you have that conversation with the with the design team. Um, and you can begin to extract at least the big quantities from from the models. The smaller elements that that not exceeding three hundred per meter, we're not going to get that from the model. You'll have to manually measure that. I would say or derive it. ARM four ceilings depths change. Um, we have a requirement in depth here. Now, you could have that conversation with the architects to say, look, we we need to at least define certain depths when you're defining your ceilings and then separate that might be the same ceiling type but separate it because it adept into a different uh, uh, element so that we can extract that quantity because it's it's of value to us now that might be on on minor cases within within certain projects it might be challenging on other projects so again that conversation early needs to happen and i think some design teams will be able to will be able to facilitate that for you um but uh, square meter price, square meter is no good. Accessories, when you're looking down here in relation to, to these elements, they'll be challenging for you. You're not going to get those elements from the model. Again, you're going to have to look at manual manual measurement, uh, deriving them from the, from the modeled information, et cetera, for a lot of uh, th these, these items. Some of the accessories will be there, like the access panels, but the edge trims and angle trims, they're, look, they're not going to be there. Um, you'll be able to get the perimeter and so on from the different uh, uh, rooms and ceilings all right to derive that from the model, but they will absolutely not model that for you. Um, this is where I, I, I believe that ARM is not fit for purpose in terms of digital, digital design, to be honest, because what value in terms of monetary value are these in the overall project? You know, uh, I think we, should, we can debate that later. Um, so... Uh, NRM, ARM, two different measurement rules, uh, two different levels of granularity, two different requirements. What can we take from the model? What can we can? What, what is not possible from the model? What needs to be derived and or manually measured? Gives a kind of an impression here. But just taking this that same project we looked at that office building, all the ceilings uh, at the moment you can see here down on, along the left, they've identified the, the different ceiling types. Now, the ceiling types, what they haven't identified here, the conversation we need to get into is sloping, curved, um, but at least what we have here is material types. So we can, on cost plan stage and cost estimation stage before we go to procurement, at least we have the bulk of the information, the majority, that 80%, that 90% of the overall value on big quants measured. It means we're not manually measuring this stuff. We can then look at the other elements that we need do we look at a provisional allowances or do we actually need to, to, to manually measure it? We need to, we need to take that view as professionals, uh, I would say. Again, on the right-hand side, the image there is the overall ceilings uh, for this particular um, project. And then we look at um, a ceiling type. So we define it down into this, this ceiling type, 35,102, um, 5,400 square meters approximately we're able to isolate it. we're able to have a look at it you can do further isolations if you need to edge trims parameters stuff like that you can dig into the model and begin to derive that stuff out but this is for us this is cost plan uh, stage we're not producing a bit of quantities here yet so this is uh, perfectly uh, suitable for for what we're doing i would say and then you get into okay you're you're mapping that to your icms structure uh, and then you're pricing it out and 
Uh, this is again Costex. What we're trying to do is we have dual language, we have uh, specification type, we have uh, work breakdown structure or package type for the contractor, et cetera, this particular project. We also will define if it's modeled or if it's manually measured once we get the bill of quantity stage um, and if uh, if it has other types. So there's lots of possibilities here you can work on um, in, in COSEX in terms of data management. And that's what we're really talking about is data management. You can get loads out of this if you look at this base information as your as your center point, and then you can begin to derive many different things from it. Um, coding structure here on 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 the left is is ICMS. You'll you'll ask me why haven't we any coding here? Actually, in our reporting structure, we have developed it so that it automatically codes numerically in numerical order all of these elements when we extract into Excel or into Word in, or in uh, sorry into Excel or into PDF or whatever. So you're not manually measuring typing codes the whole time. So we're getting away from that 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 uh, that manual stuff and 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 um, that administration stuff, I would say. Um, again, cost plan level, we're, we're not a bill of quantities uh, stage yet in this, but we're beginning to we're beginning to develop it. The next next two stages come, we'll we'll develop it more and more. So that gives you a kind of an impression, I would say, of like NRM two, what is required. Um, in terms of the method of measurement and and pricing rules and and how do how do what do we get from the models um that will allow us at least to get our a bill of quantities produced the reality is that we're not we we just not going to get everything um our method of measurements are too detailed and too granular for how our architecture and engineering um friends model um and design um perhaps in the future we might be able to derive this information. Uh, the better we get at this 80% 80, 80 of the elements and the quicker we get at that, we'll have time to focus on how do we automate and how do we get the other requirements around our method of measurement from the availability of the information in the model, in the drawings, in the spec as it sits right now. But uh, right now, what we're really saying is that you'll get large quant, big element from, from the model that will fit into your measurement rule or fit into your bill of quantities, but the other elements, you're going to have to derive them. And especially in relation to ARM uh, and the ceilings here, the depth, you're going to have to take that discussion uh, with the design team day one, get it into the BIM execution plan that they need to divide the ceiling types in relation to not just materi materials, but material type, but also into depth type for you. If you can, if you can agree that, then wonderful. You have another layer in the model that is going to be super useful for you. Um, but if you don't have that, you're going to have uh, uh, small challenges, I would say, in terms of getting the quantities accurate in relation to the method of measurement here uh, for the different depths. Um, that's just a little snapshot on on um, on architecture. Um, a couple of other elements then in, in relation to structure structures. Um, I think structures again giving an example here from from um, from Costex, your your model on the right, your on the left here is all your building components relating to that model, um, whether it is columns, uh, pad foundations, uh, uh, steel columns or concrete columns or slabs, etc. We have slightly different views here um there's three three extracts from the model top one is your is your trusses on your roof roofing system then you have your your columns base columns and beams and then underneath you have the underside of the slab showing your foundations with your uh, slide up stands um on the foundations again i would say as you if you can look down along the left hand side here you're getting the big picture elements from uh, from the model um, in 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 relation to the components and the design, you're not getting the granularity that the method of measurement requires in in certain aspects. Uh, one thing might be like, for example, in the method of measurement, we follow uh, concrete types as a as a collective concrete. Um, often, we, our agreement with the structural engineer is that if the concrete type uh, changes, it becomes a different component. So it might be. The same foundation size geometry what have you but if it's two different concrete types then for us it's a different type you need to you need to identify that as a as a different type within your within your model and engineers will do that they're they're quite good in that sense i think um in in, in developing their models in that way because it, it it adds real clarity to the um 
real clarity to the design and and communication with contractor and other stakeholder groups. What you're not going to get here is beveled edges and 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 joints and stuff like that. They're just not modeled. So again, you're going to have to derive that other that level of information. Actually, we could just talk about formwork. Formwork's not modeled. Um, you're going to have to derive the formwork uh, areas and requirements from the information available to you in the model. Like even though the pad foundation here specifies cubic meter, you can also derive the area of the sides from the from the same information in the pad foundation. It's available. We're just not showing it here, um, but it is available. And that's how we would approach that that uh, that uh, that measurement all the other aspects, the granular details, then we would have to to manually to approach from a manual measurement or on screen if we can't derive them from the model. So um, I guess, uh, again, the same, it's the same kind of message. We're not, we're never going to get everything from the model. That's the reality of it. Uh, but we can get the big numbers and, and, and big elements for sure. That should, that should at least uh, reduce a hell of a lot of the workload. And then we can consider if there's value in measuring the smaller elements, if it's a public project, of course, you might have to take that on. But uh, that that uh, that is definitely a discussion for the for the project for sure. Um, likewise, in steel, uh, I think steel is a good one because method of measurement would mean that you measure plates, um, you measure bolts. None of that stuff is modeled. Um, at least not at the moment. I think in the future it will be. I think we're going to get to a place where. Uh, automated design using uh, algorithm will allow us will allow the design team to model that information quite quickly across the models across the design um, based on certain criteria and parameter. Once they get to that level, then we're able to extract that information. But right now, that's not available. I would say, if we all reflect on the the, the detailing pack that we get from the engineers, um, none of that real detail in the in, in in the detail pack is is modeled all your connections and your joints and and all of that stuff none of that's really modeled it, it just it would take too too much time uh for them to model at, at this stage um but i do think in the future it will be i think we're going to get to a stage where they'll be able to automate a lot of that and it will absolutely help um in terms of quality during uh, execution and construction for sure and of course it'll help us in our quantification um yes so a couple of things to to be aware of i would say um i i think we talked a little bit about this before anyway when it comes to to uh the quality of information and the models we discussed it at the early stage when 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 setting up the beam execution plan and and elements like that um an example and this this is this will definitely be a challenge so the code that we see within the models, let's say a uni class, often what happens is that code is not transferred. And I think I mentioned it the last day, that code is not transferred to the drawings. And then on the drawing, you have a separate tag, which is a legacy standard coming out of engineering or architecture. Let's say a wall type, let's say a slab type or a foundation type. It could be strip foundation 001, whatever the, whatever the tradition is. Those tags are still used on drawings. And the challenge then is if you look at the drawings, you can't relate it to the building component and the model because there's no key connecting both. So we need to have a discussion there uh, with the design team about putting the not just tags on the drawing, but also putting the, the numbering or coding uh, convention on the drawing as well. Many years ago, we were using the bill of quantities as the key connecting both. We had the, the BIM reference number and we had the tag reference number in the description and then the contractor was able to use the bill of quantities as the key but ideally that should be on the drawings to make it absolutely clear what we're talking about and that's not i mentioned the last day the design teams will approach that probably manually at the moment that can be automated uh, so we have a bit of probably a bit of learning um cut lint of the steel for the frame i have an example of this later i think uh, we should always always look for cut lint, not model lint. It's uh, uh, it, it'll throw up challenges with us when we try to quantify, um, and then some other elements, generic generic models, uh, for example, existing buildings. If you're doing an extension, uh, casework, um, 
sometimes Ribbit does not uh, auto-generate geometries. Um, we need to add elements, add the information, length, area, volume, et cetera, uh, when, when we're looking at uh, the exports. Um, yes, external and internal. Um, this was an interesting one. Uh, Aidan mentioned it uh, to last week when we were talking about um, qualifying and quality assuring models. In Denmark, external, internal is a challenge. So the, the reference uh, numbering, um, it, it doesn't cover it for us. But basement, kind of basement substructure and superstructure is all also a challenge. We need to make sure that we're able to uh, split our models to identify those elements uh, so that we can we can price them separately and understand from a commercial perspective um, uh, where those costs uh, those costs sit. Um, and of course, look, not everything is modeled as we mentioned. None of the client deliverables would be modeled. You might get uh, loose furniture that might be modeled as part of the agreement with the architects and engineers. Uh, sorry, with the architects and the client. Um, it could be other times like client deliverables could be equipment. They might not model the equipment. They'll just put a placeholder uh, within the room so they know that everything fits in that room, if it's a technical space or if it's manufacturing or or what have you. Um, so we need to be clear about how um, the, the design team are going to be uh, designing that. And of course, we need to cost it as well if it's part of our remit. And as I mentioned, existing or new construction, the, the differences between that needs to be identified, it needs to be understood as well. Um, yeah, so I mentioned before drawing the, the tagging on drawings, as you can see here, 2323 23 for this particular window. Um, and it's a type mark. It can easily be put into the models. It's just that often the design teams don't really no one has, I, I suppose, approached him and, and mentioned that this is a challenge. If you don't have a connection between what's in the model and what's on the drawings, you're going to, we won't be able to understand what we're looking at, what we're reading. So um, having those tight marks is, is, is super key and referencing between the traditional tight marks that we would have from the legacy standards uh, versus the new um, uh, uh, BIM references is also uh, important. Yeah, I'm just explaining a little bit further here, talking about the steel and the cut lint uh, uh, versus modeled lint. That's that's important. It can have big differences on your quantities. And coming back to your method of measurement here, it's a it's a question to be raising as well in terms of well, how do we measure steel, for example, or columns, beams, whatever the case may be, in terms of method of measurement. Um, that needs to be understood when extracting these these quantities, maybe your method of measurement requires full lint rather than cut lint. Um, I'm not saying ARM or NRM, but international measurement standards, maybe they approach it differently. So we need to we need to be clear about that or understand it as well, at least. And the design team, they'll take no notice of this because it has no influence on, on their output. They're modeling, they'll just model. This is information within the model that is is of value to us and and uh, as long as we understand it then we can have uh, the discussion with the design team um yeah generic elements in 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 the model as we mentioned before uh, you can see here highlighted where we have uh, some elements in the model but there we don't have any quantities for what's going on there should they even be in the model is it legacy information from a previous model what's all this what are these generic elements uh, they should relate to a system should they not they should relate to a, a, a type, should they not? So again, we need to be aware of this uh, because when we do our import of, of, of the models into IFC, into our estimating platform, we'll need to map this information. So it's better that we get this quality into, um, uh, into the models and into the design information, uh, I would say. And some elements, as, as it says here, no, no quantities are generated by, by default. And there's for sure quantities behind these downpipes um, and, and drainage, it's just that they're falling under the generic model categorization. So they've been categorized incorrectly within the family types in the model. That's the architect's responsibility or the engineers get back there to them and say, you need to fix that for us. Um, also, Aidan was kind enough to, to send me his uh, screenshot again. I thought it was relevant. So we put it in talking about uh, methods of measurement and, and, um, and ARM pulling out the slabs, and this relates to slabs and the concrete element within the slab. You can see here the total cubic meter, five and a half thousand or 5,800. Um, and in deriving the 
uh, the openings, um, including or excluding, uh, in order to get the accurate quantity that can be derived from the model and, and built up in your in your workbooks and your calculation sheets as identified here. I think I'm assuming this is Qubit. I know that's what he uses. Um, and a lot of you guys out there would be using Qubit as well, uh, I would say. So um, even though the information is not directly extracted from the model, it can absolutely be derived. And I think that's our message from today. Uh, we're getting a lot of it, not all of it. Um, we can derive a lot of it, but we'll still need to do elements of, of manual quantification under our current measurement rules. And um, yes, again, from, from the last day, we're talking about uh, standardization of the cost structure. Uh, that's important. At this later stage of the design uh, um, process, we'll already sh we should already have our standards in place, whether it is uh, ICMS as our, as our first four levels of a cost structure, um, whether it is uh, our method of measurements that sit underneath uh, ICMS, be that uh, NRM or, or ARM, all of this should be identified uh, early in, in, the, um, in the process so that we're just building on layers of information, layers of information as we go through the, the design stages, like those ceilings that I, I mentioned earlier on. In the next stage, that particular ceiling type might div divide into three ceiling types because we've agreed about the method of measurement and the heights, et cetera, et cetera. So um, just about getting into the mindset of, of this and the level of detail expected then, as I mentioned, a lot of the time the design teams don't know how you're going to derive your quantities or how you're going to prepare your cost plans or whatever. Um, again, another example of, we like to define this for them and show them that when we get to detailed design, we want to quantify everything. We want unit price. It's not generic square meter price. It's not lump sum. It's not um, elements like that. We want to quantify when we're preparing our cost plans and estimates here. We want to extract as much information as possible from the design so that we become as our, 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 our cost plans and estimates are as accurate as possible at that moment in time based on that design material. So again, communication back to the design team, of what, what we're expecting to do along the life cycle at the different stages and how we are expecting to use their information to help us in our output and our process. Um, but that is it for me today um, in terms of uh, architecture and engineering. Um, I think architecture and engineering, just on a final note, really is uh, the structural engineering, the structures, the superstructure, substructure, concrete, steel elements um, are a much easier discipline to work with. Um, if you're looking to kind of test or onboard anything, I'd approach kind of that discipline first. Um, because it's just components. It's just kind of building elements, beams, columns, slabs, what have you. It's a much easier one to approach. And I think every QS prefers to measure and quantify uh, structures and construction than they do anything else. Next up, I would say is architecture. That is that is uh, 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 an easier one than, than the MEP, I would say. Two major challenges with architecture Doors, as we all know, in every bloody project, doors are a challenge, and the facade. The two of those will, will raise the biggest challenges for you, I would say, in terms of quality of information, structure, uh, and how you're able to use it. Ceilings, walls, all that other stuff we can work with for sure. And then MEP will pick up uh, in our next uh, BIM bite, and we'll talk a little bit more about that because that's a little bit more uh, it's a, it's different, I would say, because it's system based rather than component based. But that is it for me, uh, James. Over to you, bud. Hey, thanks, Ross. Uh, if anyone has any questions, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, that that may be the easiest, or pop them in the chat, and I'll, I'll read them out for you. Or any observations, even. Uh, good morning, Ross. Jim Stone here. Um, hey, Jim. Nice to see you again. Um, just a general question for the minute. Is the BIM protocol um, document still relevant and current and so forth vis-a-vis -vis the, the ICMS? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I I don't have the answer to that, actually, Jim. I don't know, um, but we'll, we'll dig into it. I do know that uh, they're looking at uh, refreshing those documents to support what is now the new requirements coming from the 1st of January, I would say. 
Um, so I, I do think that there will be a refreshment on those documents, but uh, but in terms of compliance with uh, with uh, the regulations coming, um, uh, I don't know. Okay, we might have something I, on that for the, for the BIM clinic, yeah. Yeah, any, any, anything uh, from anybody else? Does anybody else know? Have they come across that uh, or working with it or... Um, might be a good yeah for the BIM clinic. We could bring someone in to uh, to help us uh, answer that one, James. Perhaps and if we can identify someone. Yeah, we can look at that. Sure. Uh, just another question there, Ross, if I may. Um, in relation to the ICMS standards, um, hitherto we'd had the expression elemental cost plan, yeah. elemental bill of quantities based on yeah. the national standard building elements. Yeah. So is that language or title going to change when we have the ICMS? I, I, no, it's still an elemental breakdown. Uh, all ICMS does is it's, it's just a structure. It's very similar to the, the national building standards anyway, to be honest. You know, it's okay. uh, it's substructure, superstructure. And maybe there's a maybe there's a need to to dig into ICMS a little bit further. Maybe that's part of the the uh, workshop, James, as well, perhaps just to dig into it uh, and, and show how ICMS really kind of works and relates then to uh, ARM, but it is an elemental breakdown uh, for sure. And and as I was showing there uh, on Costex, uh, elemental breakdown, and then if it is a work breakdown structure you're using or package based, if it's uh, management mm -hmm. contracting or whatever, I st we still use ICMS as the cost structure. We still use we still approach it on an elemental basis, and then we map into the packages. And our output from Costex is a work work packages work breakdown structure. So okay. what you're doing is your base. Your base calculations, your base estimates are always the same standard. And then you can map that standard to anything else that client requirements, procurement structures, whatever the contractual relationship uh, requirements are. But I would I would say, at least that's my advice and how we've approached it is data needs a, a standard structure from which you can work with and work within. And then it can be extracted and restructured in any form afterwards. Um, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, just two final quick questions there, if I may, please. Um, the IPMS, has that any relevance to the QS? Yeah, International Property Standards. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, there's, if you look at the kind of evolution of, of information and, and the standard requirements from, from the client side, you're talking about the BIM execution plan. You're going back into the the employer's requirements, IPS standards, etc. All of that mm -hmm. is relevant when it comes to standardization of information and data. So I would say it is it is relevant to us because if you look at uh, ICMS, it's not just about a cost breakdown structure. It's also about project information standards. So yeah. collecting that project information correctly on every project. Uh, will allow us in the future to understand those historical projects better. So I think IPMS absolutely has a place to play there for sure. Okay. And finally then, maybe for the BIM clinic, if you could have an example of a BIM execution plan, you know, uh, generated by the PQS for the intended yeah. purpose. We have, uh, yeah, we have a couple of documents uh, internally I, I, I can uh, show you guys uh, in, in the clinic. Uh, one would be a, the annex to the BIM execution plan for 5D and 6D. So that's the quantity surveyors requirements for cost and carbon. And then we have a document we've produced internally, uh, which is uh, it's it's BIM for the quantity surveyor and architect engineer, the design leads, a, a document that they can sit down and discuss around. So it, it has prompts and questions and so on the QS can use. So it can ask the architect and engineer and, and likewise backwards stuff that we have we've we felt that it, we were repeating on every single project always we just brought that mm -hmm. together in a, in a document um but i can, right. I, can show, I can show you that internally as well um or sorry within the uh, the clinics the next day so th there's kind of four points there i think uh, james for the clinic um yeah that's that's great for us thank you for answering those questions and look forward to next session thank you no bother just put in the chat there a link to the IPMS and um, there's a there's also a link to an SSI guide to mapping the NSBE to ICMS. It might not answer the question you have, Jim, but it might just help with context. Um, so mm. hope those are helpful. Great, there. James. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Jim, did, and did you see the uh, the document in the SCSI uh, BIM for QSs? Did you did you come across that one? Uh, I don't know if we mentioned it. I think we did, but um, 
we prepared it a couple of years ago and it, it really talks about the different uh, requirements of uh, of uh, the BIM execution plan for quantity surveyors and the questions you should be asking and what you should be looking out for. Okay. Uh, maybe I did it at a time, but it's no bother. escaped my memory at the moment. No, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no hassle. It's uh, yeah. yeah, it's quite comprehensive. I think, for I'll, I'll check it out. The, uh, Thank you. The link in the chat there now. Oh yeah, link in the chat right. there. No, that's a good one for anybody in internally for you, for your teams or something just to have a read over. Just what you'll end up seeing is that a lot of what we're talking about is reflected in that document, and it's just again it's adding another refreshment to the terminology and so on, um, so that these conversations can be taken with the with the design teams and your clients, etc. So, and I would say that this will evolve um, over the coming years for sure, um, like the standards now that are in place. Uh, the new method of measurement, we need to figure out that they work, uh, the BIM execution plan, the requirements and government, all of that stuff. It's all, it'll, it'll all be evolving over the next number of years. Um, this is a journey, uh, It's uh, I would say, yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions in the chat there? Anyone else want to want to ask anything? No? Super. Great. Well, I just thank um, all of our participants for joining us today. And, uh, and thanks as usual, Ross, for another great presentation. And uh, see you all again on Monday for the for the final session before the clinic. Uh, yes. Have a great weekend. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thank uh, take it easy. Enjoy, your, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you.